<laughs> one heart, one mind, one soul. Um, and so there is a oneness. And that includes the things that we apply ourselves in, and it includes the things that we believe. And so we do need to be in a position where we believe the same things. So we come and we share um, the revelation that God has given us. Um, and as Francois said, we don't talk often about money. Um, in fact, this is only the second time in probably so many years that I've been asked to share on it. Um, but it doesn't really exist in a vacuum. Um, and really our position has always been that giving is an expression and an extension of the relationship that we each individually have with the Lord Jesus. And so it is as the Holy Ghost moves upon you, as relationship grows, as the Holy Ghost directs, that there is a liberty in giving. Um, so there's never been the situation where we've said, well, you need to give this, that, and the next thing, in this amount, and that amount, and at this time, and in this fashion. Um, but really it has been as the Lord has moved upon the hearts of men and women to meet the needs that arise and to so apply themselves. But the, there is a teaching and there, there are principles involved and it really is in a very specific context. And if you'd like to go with me to the book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. And always when you're going to share on a topic like this, you've got to decide just how deep you're going to go. How many layers of the onion peel you're going to remove. So we'll go as deep as the Lord allows us. Um, and we'll see how we, we fare. So chapter 2 of 1 Peter verse 5, you'll know the scripture says, You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And this really is the context in which um, giving finds its expression. Um, the fact that we as individual members are living stones being part of a house that is in fact the body of Christ or the church and that this house or church isn't just a building but in fact is a royal priesthood and the priesthood has a very specific function um, and as New Testament believers we firmly hold to the principle of the believer priesthood so each and every one of us are priests and the scripture again underlines that you are a priest I'm a priest whether you're a brother or a sister um, you are a priest um, of the Lord Jesus a believer priest um, and it says that to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So in the same fashion as the Old Testament priesthood, the Levitical priesthood would come and function within the temple and there present spiritual sacrifices to God. So you and I, as the New Testament believer priesthood, who has a high priest um, after the order of Melchizedek, the Lord Jesus himself, we are called upon within this temple, within this house, to present spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through the Lord Jesus. And the scripture speaks about five uh, sacrifices, these spiritual sacrifices in the New Testament context. And all of them, in fact, touch upon what uh, we'll be talking about today. But there is one in particular um, that speaks directly to what we want to consider. And that you can find in Hebrews chapter 13. So Hebrews 13. So remember that this principle of giving is in the context of us exercising the responsibility of our priesthood before God. And it says this in verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 13. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. I'm going to read it again. But uh, verse 16. Uh, Hebrews 13, verse 16. Are we all there? But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So this, there's two sacrifices there. To do good and to communicate. Communicate is really just an old English word for share or to meet a need. So Paul speaks about this ability and responsibility of communicating. So we really understand that now giving, because that's what sharing is about, it's about giving. Um, we are 
exercising our responsibility and performing our service within the, the body of Christ as priests and priests after the order of Melchizedek. Um, forgive all the scriptures, but it's really just to establish this principle uh, in Philippians chapter 4. So if you go to Philippians chapter 4, I try not to present too many scriptures and we're paging this way and that way, but I think because of the topic we need to establish these things properly and you'll want to know where the scriptures are. So Philippians chapter 4. So we see here in verse 14, Paul speaking to the Philippian church, he says, Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. So communication is not just so much as sharing, but in fact becoming someone who gets involved. You now involve yourself, you become a partaker in the need. And here it was, Paul was saying, in my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. And now Paul starts to open up this idea of communication. Uh, communication or sharing is a two-way street. It's not only giving, it is also receiving. And it was alluded to in the introductions, freely you have received, freely give. So the principle is that we have freely received. And what have we received? Well, from the Lord Jesus we have received all things. So we have received all things, and so we are to give in the same liberality in which we have received. We now give all things. So he goes on and he says this in verse 16, For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. So it's not just a one-off thing, it is a continual application of this giving so long as the need is there or any need is there. So he goes on, verse 17, Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. So this giving, having received freely, we now give freely and we are communicating with the needs of others, produces within us a spiritual Fruit. So it's not some want a gift. It's not that there are specific uh, lacks or needs, wants that we're looking now to minister to and, and we want to put a new roof on the church and lay a carpet and provide for this or that. Whether it is a, a temporal thing or a spiritual necessity, it's really about um, bringing about within each and every one of us a place where we can produce fruit and be fruitful. So to stand in a place where you can take up your responsibility as a priest in the house of God and to minister in that capacity, communicating with others, produces within you and within me a fruit that in fact is pleasing to God. And let's go on here. It says here in verse 18, and puts it really in, the, in, another, in, this, in exactly what we've said, but I have all and abound. So Paul says, I'm really not in lack, although you are providing and communicating for me in my affliction. And he says, I'm not in lack because God is my provider. So I am expecting provision from God, and that provision comes by means of your application in your measure um, and service as a priest. And he says, yeah, and abound. So, and and he's, he's, he's in a place where he needs some help, but he says, I'm not in a place where I have nothing, and I abound, so it's in anticipation of what God is going to provide. He says, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So you see again this very clear idea that this is a spiritual sacrifice. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. So he says, my need has been supplied and your need will supply, will be supplied. And then just to further emphasize and highlight the principle, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 17. Paul charged them that are rich in this world 
that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So really underlines what we've said. We've received all things. That they do good, again, spiritual sacrifice, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So this principle of giving is to give of whatever we have received liberally from the Lord Jesus, um, both spiritual and temporal. Another one of the spiritual sacrifices we are called upon to offer is in um, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where we are called upon to present our bodies as living sacrifices. And in close con connection to that, the Scripture says, you are not your own, you have been bought with a price. And so all that I am, whether um, it's my own physical present body, and all that I have, whatever I can count as my means, I say is not my own, and I lay it at the feet of the Lord Jesus um, as a living sacrifice. So this idea of giving isn't just about taking some of my money and putting it in the collection tin and saying, okay, well, I've fulfilled my responsibilities uh, to the church. Well, it's not about fulfilling my responsibility to the church. It's not about taking a certain percentage of my financial uh, income and saying, well, that's it. That's what the Lord asks. That's what the Lord gets. And maybe once in a while when there is, is a need, um, I might contribute a little more. Uh, but the Lord Jesus says very clearly through um, the writer of Hebrews that all priests are taken from among men for the specific purpose to offer up both gifts and spiritual sacrifices. And this aspect of giving falls very firmly and squarely in that spiritual sacrifice application. So let's go now to Acts chapter 2. This is often used to, to guide the application of giving. Um, and I don't agree fully with the way it's often implemented. But may God give us grace to understand it. This is the time where Peter, having stood up at Pentecost, the believers having just, 120 of them, having just been um, empowered and filled with the Holy Ghost, um, Peter preaches, and in that same day, at that same moment, 3,000 new believers are added to the church. So in a flash, goes from 120 to 3,120, um, and they receive the word, they get baptized, they're now part of this church. They are believer priests. At that moment, they are, they are believer priests. They're part of this priesthood. They're part of the spiritual house. And it says there in verse 44, and all that believed were together. So there is this aspect of being together or being one and had all things common. So in being one, we are not one just in an intellectual way. We're not one just by virtue of the fact that the doctrine says that, um, but we are together, we are one, and that has to practically be demonstrated in the way that we behave and act. And it says that they chose to do it this way and had all things common. So nothing was counted to be this man's possession or that man's possession. Um, and they take it even a step further, and perhaps it is important to put this in context um, they were men and women who were anticipating the very soon return of the Lord Jesus. And as the Holy Ghost administered the imminent return of the Lord Jesus, the, the revelation of the kingdom of God, they were pressed in their own hearts to say, look, we want nothing to do with this current world. We want to be absolutely ready for the return of the Lord Jesus. And they saw the trappings of their lives as things that would now hinder them that would get into the way of, of being ready for the return of the Lord Jesus. And they said, look, we're not going to let these things get in the way. We're going to lay them at the 
feet of the Lord Jesus. We're going to, to make sure that we have all things in common. So no man said, this is mine and that's yours. And they go further and they say, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. So they didn't just come and pool their resources and say, okay, well, this is now our, our kitty and we'll just draw from it. No, they began to minister it to individual men and women. And in the book of Corinthians, it speaks about trying to bring about this idea of there being an equality. Um, and we can turn to that scripture. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> And I'm going to read a little further down before we go back to verse 1. It says there, speaking about giving, it's verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might be rich. And, herein, and there, there is the principle we see Paul's talking about in Acts chapter 2, is that being rich, they now gave, and in a sense put themselves in a poverty, poverty being ready just to give and have nothing in excess, um, so that others might now be enriched. Um, so he goes on and he says this, um, and herein I give my advice, for this is excellent for you, who have begun before, not only to do but also to be forward a year ago. So speaking about their desire to give, and in fact they had already begun giving, and they were forward in it, or there was a real liberality in their giving. He says this, Now therefore perform doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, and in that scripture in Timothy we saw there was this idea that you need to be ready to distribute. So it speaks about a heart, and a mind. Um, your application, are you ready? Are you willing? Are you holding on to things? Or are you saying, Lord, whatever I have, whatever I am, I'm giving to you to use as you will. Speaks of a readiness. And he says, you were there was a readiness to will. So there may be a performance also out of that which you have. So it's not only an intention, a readiness to say, Lord, whatever you need, I'll, I'm willing to give it. But in fact, then to do just that, um, there's that saying that says the road to hell is paved with many good intentions. Um, very true in the church. We have lots of good intentions, but we seem never always to find a way to perform those things. So he says, don't only will it, but now do it. And verse 12, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man has, and not according to what he has not. So you're not being asked to give what you don't have. You're being asked to give what you have in the light of the fact that what we have, we have received from Christ. So it is not our own labor. It is not the works of our hands. It's not our own means. And we see this right in the beginning with the account of Cain and Abel. What does Cain do? He brings the labor of his own hands. And he wants to offer them to God. But what is the acceptable offering? It is the offering of the Lamb, which is the bounty of God's provision. So not your own giving of what you have to give, but in fact what God has given you. The Old Testament, as they applied it, the same thing went for the tithe that was required of them. And uh, just to make a note that the tithe wasn't 10%, it came to about 25% of the community's income. And what was tithed was the produce of the field. And what was given to God had to be that which He had provided them. So it was stuff that grew. Artisans, people like the Lord Jesus, um, who was by trade a carpenter, was exempt because they could not give of their handiwork. It had to be the bounty of God's provision. And so we see the same principle here, not what you don't have, but that which you have, not by the labor of your hands, but by the provision of God. And he goes on and he says this, verse 13, For I mean not that other men be eased, and you burdened. So we, we, we're not giving so that others can uh, take a rest 
from the labor of life. The scripture says if a man wants to eat, he must work. Clear principle. Um, so we're not yet to ease some. And I know that often the ministry is maligned because there is this appearance that they uh, take their, their ease with others work and labor to support them. But the scripture says, no, I mean not that other men be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. And as it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. So he says here, and he's, he's speaking about the people of Israel as they gathered manna in the wilderness. Again, not the labor of their hands, so they didn't go and grow their crops and tend their flocks and say, well, this is the labor of a hand. In fact, this manna, this provision fell from heaven. And what we read in Exodus, and I won't turn you there, you can go and find it. Um, the people go out, and they told, go out and gather every man a certain measure in Omer. You're supposed to gather a certain measure for each person in your family. And out you go, and what appears to be the case is they took baskets, they go out, and in fact they gathered. And they gathered by eye, so they didn't take their little measure with them, and they sort of said, okay, that's for Sally, and that's for Susan, and that's for Mom, and that's for Dad. They gathered, and they gathered by eye. And what Exodus says is some gathered much and some gathered less. But when they got back to the camp, the measure was now taken and they began to measure out. And as they measured out, they found even though some had gathered much and others had gathered little, everyone got exactly what they needed, got enough, and there was none over and no one lacked. In fact, a demonstration of the fact that it is God that is a provider. And remember, they were told to go and collect that with a clear understanding that they weren't to collect more than what they needed for the day because God would provide the same tomorrow. And so in our giving, we are to receive from God and if we have been blessed with an abundance, it is for the purpose that we might supply the want of others and the want of the, the church, because that's really where we are applying ourselves in this house, which is a royal priesthood, the temple of God, the body of Christ. And He will provide for us, and as long as we give, He will provide. And I, I want to also raise one of my favorite Old Testament accounts, uh, and it is account of the prophet and the widow. And the, the, I'm sure you know the story well. He's been cared for in a cave, a uh, raven brings him meat, and uh, there's a water running through the middle of the cave. And it's the absolute and total provision of God. Uh, I don't think anyone on a regular basis gets fed by ravens. Um, I've certainly not had the experience. So it certainly was a miraculous event. But as the drought in, gets worse and the, the prophet is hiding out because Jezebel wants to put him to death, um, he finds this little rivulet runs dry. Um, and you can do without food uh, for a while, but water you can't do without at all. And so it now becomes necessary for him to leave this place. And at the same God time, God now stops the raven from bringing him food. And by the, the Spirit of God, he goes to a woman. Um, and this woman is a widow. She has a son. And he and her are suffering as everybody else is suffering from drought. And in fact, she's there gathering the few last sticks um, to light a fire, to take the last measure of their oil and the last measure of their flour. She's going to make a flat cake out of it, bake it on the fire. They're going to share it, and then there's nothing else to eat. And the anticipation is that they're now going to proceed with this very slow um, death of uh, by starvation. You don't die overnight. I know sometimes you miss a meal, you feel like you're going to die. <laughs> but it uh, takes a, a while. <laughs> it takes a while, quite a while. <laughs> yes. Well, it's not just for the young ones, I can tell you. <laughs> um, but it takes a while. And they were just surrendering to that outcome. And they would not have been the first. They would have seen others dying from starvation. And, the, and, and so it was really one cake... Of, of 
made or not was going to make no real difference in the broader outcome. But in a sense, it was sort of their last meal together. And the prophet comes and he says, won't you give me something to eat? And she says, look, this is the last. We're going to eat it and we're going to die. And he says to her, well, look, don't worry about that. Just go and make that for me. And she, she responds to that. What her thinking was behind that, the scripture doesn't tell us. But she goes and she makes this loaf. She gives it to him. And, and I don't know if he sat there and slowly ate it in front of him <laughs> as they, they slavered and thought, because have you smelt fresh bread? <laughs> well, <laughs> don't fast near a bakery, I tell you. That's not going to work. And so he ate it and then he says, well, go make yourself one. And again, she goes and, she, and lo and behold, there is enough oil and enough wheat in the, the, the containers for another loaf. And so as time goes on, she's able to make for the prophet and able to make for her and her son, but each time only what is required is provided. And the principle I want to draw out of that account is that she showed a readiness to distribute irrespective of her own condition, she showed a readiness to distribute. And that's really the heart that is required from you and I, to show a readiness to distribute what in fact is God's vision. And so we, we want to just go to the beginning of this chapter, and I want to read it to you in a, a more basic English, because I think it captures very much the, the spirit of what we want to say. Uh, chapter 2, still the same chapter of 2 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Just a little further. We read from verse 9. I'm going to just read you from verse 1. Paul speaking to the Corinthians, he says, And now we give you news, brothers, about the grace of God which has been given to the churches of Macedonia. How while they were undergoing every sort of trouble, and were in the greatest need, they took all the greater joy in being able to give freely to the needs of others. For I give them witness that as they were able, and even more than they were able, they gave from the impulse of their hearts, seriously requesting us that they might have a part in this grace of being servants to the needs of the saints. What a heart. That's the heart that um, comes from the relationship we enjoy with the Lord Jesus. Because isn't that the heart of the Lord Jesus Himself? Did He not give His whole self? Coming uh, to us, He set aside His heavenly glory. We alluded to that in that He set aside His riches. And in fact, out of His riches, He now gives His whole self. And as a sacrifice... He presents His body. He presents all that is His. And He says, come, let me be a willing part of this ministry. And it goes on in verse 5, and going even farther than our hope. So Paul said, we had a certain hope and expectation from you. Not because we looked at you and said, oh sure, these Corinthians, they earn a good good uh, bit. Um, they, they're a wealthy church. They're not like the guys that live out in rural areas. These guys in the city turn some coin. Um, we, we're hopeful of good return. No, the hope was that there would be fruit from the relationship that they are enjoying with the Lord Jesus. So our giving, once again, is a fruit of our relationship. And he goes on and he says, going even far farther than our hope, they first gave themselves to the Lord. You see the principle? They first gave themselves to the Lord. So we're not looking for the, the, the donations and offerings of the heathen. We're looking for the application of those that are born again. And in fact, you can't understand this principle of giving until you have given yourself to the Lord. And he says, and to us. So we give ourselves to the Lord, um, but that can be a very spiritual application, can't it? It can be something we say we do. So how do I demonstrate that I have given myself to the Lord? I do it practically by giving myself to you as you give yourself 
to me. So there must be a practical application. And he says, after the purpose of God. So that we made a request to Titus that, as he had made a start before, so he might make this grace complete in you. And that as you are full of every good thing, of faith, of the word, of knowledge, of a ready mind, and of love to us. So now he speaks about those spiritual things. He says, you're full of these things. He says, so you may be full of this grace in the same way. So this this sacrifice, this giving, is put right up there with the same things as doing every good thing, in fact, being full of them, being full of faith, being full of the Word, being full of knowledge, being full of a ready mind, and being full of love. He says, be full also in this grace. So, how did Paul administer this giving? Because there was an administering of it. And we, we can go to all the scriptures and you can, in your time, I see we don't have a lot of time, but I do want to cover these things just briefly. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 7, we see him speak particularly about providing uh, support for those that labor among us. And in, in particular, there it was um, those elders or overseers who labor in word and doctrine. So the principle is set that those that labor in word and doctrine, those who minister to our, uh, our needs, um, need to be supported in that work, that they might give themselves all the more to that work. And again, that principle is established early in the church where deacons are, are set uh, in the church, they ordain them to take care of the mundane things, the temporal things, so that the um, apostles can now apply themselves to the word and doctrine. Um, but what is that mundane? Um, the mundane speaks about the collection of the means um, that the giving has now provided. So we need to see that need and we need to supply that need because it is in fact a mystery to ourselves. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 1 to 18, the scripture speaks in great length uh, um, about the principle of sacrificial giving. And I encourage you to go and read that and to draw from that um, the, the principle that we have been talking about. It, it really doesn't go beyond what we've already said. Um, but I want us to come now to a point that often is used when we talk about giving. And the point is again seen in Acts, and it's where everything is taken. Men sell what they had in common. And in fact, in this instance, they're selling excess land, um, and they bring it, and they lay it at the apostles' feet. Um, and this has been taken as a principle by which we now function. We say, well, we, we take what we have, um, in our case, our income, and we bring it and we lay it at the apostles' feet, and the apostles now distribute it. And to support that, Paul is held up to say, well, Paul took those gifts and offerings that were presented to him by the Gentile believers, and he now distributed it to the church in Jerusalem. Um, but there is a context to both those instances. In the first instance, um, the church had now come together. They were divesting themselves of all their earthly trappings because they were waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so they were saying, look, we're getting rid of our worldly possessions. We're now laying them at the apostles' feet that they might distribute it among us because we are now living um, in a communal way. And so the deacons now would have come and applied themselves in distributing that to make sure that nobody lacked and nobody had much and they were supporting a community. And I think we can draw some principles from that idea that we are supporting the community of believers through our application of giving within the parameters that we have discussed. Um, but this then leads on to the giving now that is required and Paul calls for um, when he approaches the Gentile churches. Because at that time there's great drought uh, throughout Palestine. And in fact, it is a death situation. And again, in Jerusalem, people are starving. 
And Paul, seeing the need of the believers, and because in a sense they've now even given up working, um, they're not bringing in their own personal incomes, they're living off this blade at the apostles' feet, they now find themselves in incredible need. The price of, of food spikes, um, and they can't, even with what they have, buy food and supply the need. And so Paul now says, look, we need to meet that need. There is a great need. And so the giving that Paul distributes is to meet a very specific need. And in truth, it is the starving of believers in Jerusalem. Um, so those things really are within a specific context. But giving and the application of that which is given is always within a local context. Even here in Jerusalem, it was in the context of the local church. And so it's the local church that supplies the need of the local church, but not only the need of the local church, but has a greater vision for the larger work and is willing to supply the need wherever they may identify it. I want us to then just consider this idea of tithing, because this all sort of works into this idea that we need to tithe. And a tithe is a tenth. It's ten percent, and as the churches apply it in the greater Christian work, um, you pay your tenth of your salary, and depending on how spiritual you are, it's a tenth of your grace as opposed to the tenth of your net. Um, and so you put that into the collection tin and you rub your hands of it. You might attend uh, the meetings that that um, distribute that. You may not. Um, my experience is many people don't really want to have much with that side of things. Although when it doesn't go the way they want it, then they want to have their say after the fact. Um, but there is a responsibility as we give to administer that giving and distribution. Um, but this idea of a tithe is an Old Testament principle. And as we've already noticed, the full tithe that Israel was required to bring was 25%. And that not everyone was subject to the tithe, and only those that drew um, provision from an agrarian existence. Um, we see even the Pharisees um, and Sadducees keep their mint and their garden, and they tithe of that. Um, so artisans didn't tithe at all. But every single person was subject to what was called the temple tax. And really, tithe, as it's been applied in the greater church, um, is closely resem resembles the temple tax as opposed to the Old Testament tithe. And so, in a real way, the church is taxing believers on their income. Um, and what the Lord Jesus tells us in Matthew, if you want to go with me to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. Here some come and they ask Peter if um, the Lord Jesus is going to pay his temple tax. Um, and uh, we're going to read from verse 24. It says, Then when they had come to Capernaum, those who took the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does not your master make payment of the temple tax? He says, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus said to him, What is your opinion, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth get payment or tax? From their sons or from other people? And when he said from other people, Jesus said to him, Then are the sons free. But so that we may not be a cause of trouble to them, go to the sea and let down a hook and take the first fish which comes up, and in his mouth you will see a bit of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. So here is this application of the temple tax. And the Lord Jesus um, is now obviously preaching. His fame has gone abroad. And they come to Peter and they say, well, your master, now pay this tax. And he obviously has no answer to that. He hasn't a clue. And he says, well, of course, he's a good Jew. He's going to pay his tax. And the right answer when the tax man comes, you don't say, no, I'm not paying my tax. You say, yes, the, the check is in the mail. Um, but he comes to the Lord Jesus now, and I think he's sort of like, well, Lord, are you going to pay? Aren't you going to pay? What do we do in this situation? Uh, maybe he said, Lord, you are paying your tax, aren't you? Um, and the Lord Jesus says, well, Simon, what do you think? When kings tax, who do they tax? And remember, we're speaking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
And in the scripture, he's saying, as king of kings and lord of lords, I am exempt from tax. And in fact, if there is going to be any tax placed, I am the one who shall place the tax. And he says, who is taxed? Does the king tax his own children, his sons? Or does he tax others? And of course, the answer is others. And so what does the Lord Jesus say? He says, then are the sons free. And I want to tell you, this is the principle behind our giving. We are giving not because we must. We're giving not because of a law. We're giving not because of a rule. We're not even giving because this is the practice. We are giving because we are free. We are free. And we are free to give. And so the Lord Jesus then says, well, look, we're not going to cause trouble. I'm free to withhold and I'm free to give. And you are free to withhold and you are free to give. But go and pay them. So there is this idea that we are free. We are the children. Now, in fact, sons of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we are free. But it doesn't mean that we take that freedom and we use it to our own gain. We use it in the context of the things that we are saying. I want to finish with the last scripture, and it is Hebrews chapter 7. And I, I want to look at the scripture because this scripture has been used as a defense for Old Testament tithing. Hebrews chapter 7. It says there in verse 1, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. How's our time? For this Melchizedek, the king of Salem, a priest of the Most High God, who gave Abraham his blessing, meeting him when he came back after putting the kings to death, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of everything which he had, being first named king of righteousness, and then in addition, king of Salem, that is to say, king of peace, being without father or mother or family, having no birth or into his life, being made like the Son of God, is a priest forever. Now see how great this man was, to whom our father Abraham gave a tenth part of what he had got in the fight. And it is true that by the law, those of the sons of Levi who have the position of priests may take a tenth part of the people's goods. That is to say, they take it from their brothers, though these are the sons of Abraham. But this man, who was not of their family, took the tenth from Abraham and gave a blessing to him to whom God had given his undertaking. But there is no doubt that the less gets his blessing from the greater. Now at the present time, men over whom death has power take the tenth. But then it was taken by one of whom it is witnessed that he is living. And we may say that in Abraham, even Levi, who, was, who has a right to take the tenth part, gave it, because he was still in his father's body when Melchizedek came to him. Now, if it was possible for things to be made complete through the priests of the house of Levi, for the law was given to the people in connection with them, what need was there for another priest who was of the order of Melchizedek and not of the order of Aaron? Because if the priests are changed, it is necessary to make a change in the law. So what we, we see, and I'm going to just break it down in this way. We see that the Lord Jesus is representative of um, Melchizedek, or Melchizedek is a symbol and type of the Lord Jesus, and he is the symbol and type of a new and a better high priesthood. And in fact, he is the ultimate vision of God for the high priesthood. And he is a better covenant, he is a better um, um, priesthood based on better principles. And it is a replacement for that which came, which is the Levitical priesthood. So we see there very clearly that there is a change of priesthood, and with the changing of a priesthood, there is a changing of the law. So we can very clearly, just from that statement, say that with the changing of the law, the tenth, and the law of the tenth, falls away. It has been replaced. And what has it been replaced by? The very principle we have been discussing, um, this idea of the sacrificial giving 
of each and every one of us who is a believer priest and a high priest who is after the order of Melchizedek. So we are not of the Levitical priesthood. We are of the Melchizedekan. If I can use that term, I don't know if that's how you would frame it, but of that priesthood. And it goes on to say this, that in Abraham we find Levi and all of Israel. And what are they doing? They are giving the tenth. But even though Levi in Abraham's loins is giving, there is this principle established that the priesthood doesn't give, it receives. So the priesthood receives the tithe. Um, the priesthood having already given. So in the same sense, we can then take that to the new priesthood and also say that it is the priesthood that is not in this sense receiving tithes, but are the receivers of and have in fact received, because we have received it in the Lord Jesus. Even as the sons of Levi gave in Abraham, so we have already received in Christ. So it's not that we are now looking to receive. We have received. The sons of Levi weren't even there, um, but they are counted to be there in Abraham. And so they have been counted to have given. We were not there. But the Lord Jesus was there in the picture and type of Melchizedek. And so we are counted to have received in him. Um, so it goes on and he says that this is a better priesthood. And so again it is the principle that having received, we now freely give. And we, we need to look to the Lord to guide us and direct us. Um, Paul clearly indicates that um, collection of funds is a good way to apply ourselves. And he did it again in the context of supplying Jerusalem's need. And he says, look, before I get there, make a collection, explain the need, known, and as the folk uh, feel led, let them give liberally. And have that correct collection ready so that we don't need to come and explain all of this. Um, it is ready and we can do what we need to do there in terms of the ministry that the Lord Jesus has given us amongst you. And we can take this which you have given, this wonderful blessing and sacrifice and offering unto God, we can take and minister, a ministry of which you are a part. And so Paul might have been the agent by which the giving was done, but the hands of everyone that had participated were counted part of that work. And so we are able to share in the grace of giving and bear the fruit of, of giving and having freely received. We are now able to freely give. So there is a need to administer these things. And we need to do it wisely, rather after liberty, as opposed to after a law. And maybe just to put tithing as it's entered into the Christian um, tradition and church into perspective, uh, for the first 200 years of early church, there was no tithing. The giving that we have explained today is the manner in which the early church functioned. That's how they gave. Um, and the truth of the matter is that many of those that labored in word and doctrine um, lived very frugal lives and often in poverty. And this began to become an issue for one man by the name of Cyprian about 257 years after the founding of the church. And he said, you know, this shouldn't be because um, it shows a lack of respect for the ministry. And if you, you look at that, it sounds like a, a good idea, but we're starting to see the very first divisions of clergy and laity. So there is a subtlety of deception um, in an application that we need to be careful to avoid. Um, so they say, he says, look, let's put this out there. What do people think? And people thought about this for another hundred odd years. Um, and uh, then at a certain uh, gathering uh, of People, um, they say, look, you know, it's a good thing that we now implement the tithe. It's really a good thing. And, and that's recorded actually in the Catholic Encyclopedia, and I want to read it to you. Um, not that I'm, I'm using it as a legitimate source. <laughs> I'm using it here as a historical reference. Um, so don't go get your doctrine from that, please. Um, I just want to find where I have it. Um, there we go. There we go. It says this. 
And this is just a record of the historical um, event. As the church expanded and various institutions arose, it became necessary to make laws. We need to be careful of that. And we've made a law of giving, which would ensure the proper and permanent support of the clergy. So we see the idea behind the institutionalized giving. The payment of tithes was adopted from the old law. The earliest positive legislation on the subjects seems to be contained in the letter um, of the bishops assembled at Tours in 567 and the canons of the Council of um, Mason, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, in 585. So that's when it became canon law, when it was instituted as a, a law that needed to be adhered to, and it took another few hundred years before you actually got put into prison for not paying your tithes. In England, if you didn't pay your tithe, you got a visit from the sheriff and your next stop was jail. Um, that's how legal it became. And what was the purpose besides what we've seen here um, when the church became legitimate? Because for many, many years it was persecuted. It was poor. They met in houses, they met secret, they met under trees, and they met wherever they could. Um, they had no great cathedrals, no buildings. They had no infrastructure to, to require management and support. But suddenly the emperor, the Roman emperor, gets converted and he makes a declaration. He says, the state religion now is Christianity. And so all those who were anybody decided that in order to get government tenders, they needed to be um, part of the straight state religion. And with that goes a certain responsibility. And the emperor says to the Christian church, look, you can't be meeting in homes. You know, the state religion, there needs to be temples. There needs to be great um, buildings. You need to look the part. And so the church said, well, that will be wonderful. Um, what funds are you allocating to us? And the emperor being um, Roman uh, emperor said, look, my treasury <laughs> is not covering that. You're going to need to cover that. And so the church now had to begin to pay for the building of the trappings of being the state religion. So really what I'm saying is that in the scripture, and certainly in the New Testament scripture, you can find no reference, no support, and no teaching on the application that we have by tradition received um, in the Christian community. But the giving that we have described is the heart that the Lord Jesus requires from us. It is drive and the purpose behind our giving. And in the, this giving, there is this fundamental objective that all drawn together. It is the expression of the love of Jesus Christ. And so when I give, I don't give grudgingly, I give freely, I give willingly, I give it in the light of the fact that this is a spiritual sacrifice that is well-pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. 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 The spoils, yes. That's correct. No. Yes. It was a once off event, and it wasn't his own wealth. It was the spoils of war. Um, and he didn't come back. That's another point that you can draw from that. Is he didn't come back again and again to Melchizedek and offer him a contribution. The bounty. So it's not the work of our hands. <laughs> you aren't? Sure. You're not spiritual enough, that's why. <laughs> you need to pray on. No. <laughs> no. Uh, well, it's the principle that what increase we have, we have of God. So in terms of our application, here we are. We go and we work because we must eat. So that's the point of our labor. We work to eat. Whatever is beyond that, whatever is given to us as a bounty, in fact, is the bounty of God. And you'll read it there in the, 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 the Corinthians, um, it was a 2 Corinthians, I think, 
or 1 Corinthians verse 1 to 18, um, where we really find that the express God gives us an increase that we might use it for this purpose. So we, we work to eat, um, and that's the labor of our hands. Whatever is excess is in fact the bounty of God. And it's out of that excess that we are giving. Yes. That's it. Yes. Yes. And I don't think there should be a condemnation then to try and, I don't know, from some no. good job facility. No. Give. Absolutely because not. If I don't give this, God's not going to bless me. That's no. God's going to bring good information. It does. Yeah. But such a one should rather just of his uh, time and, his, and being a living sacrifice. Yes. Yes. Be because giving isn't just financial, yeah. it's the giving of all that we are. Yes. Right. No. That's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so then, Abs is paying. <laughs> no, definitely not. Because then you make God your debtor, and He says, "God is no man's debtor." Yes. You don't go to the end Giving something that's less, and then you say, uh, I've now given. Yes. So one must be careful of that. You must be open of what I did here, and what I agree with, is the Lord can sometimes come to you and ask for more. Yes. And offer you uh, maybe 60 or 70 percent, or maybe all. Yes. And then secondly, also what one must be careful for is after giving that, then for the next few months you say, but you're, I've had a whopper of a month that I gave in July, so the following Well, ultimately, we not under law, we're under grace. And each of us must act by and through the constraining love of the Lord Jesus. So um, we're not, as a fellowship of believers, are going to put anyone under a law. But what we're going to say that you and I, together, stand before the Lord Jesus. He is our judge. He reads our heart. He knows what our motives are and our conniving might be. And so... If I'm going to do that, what am I doing is I'm doing it for a show, aren't I? And I'm really entering into a dead work. I'm making this precious sacrifice, not a sacrifice, but a dead work. And I'm saying, well, Lord, you owe me. I've done my bit. Um, and that really speaks to this whole principle. And as you said, it's a, it's a principle that speaks not only of doing a certain amount, but of giving whatsoever God has given you. So your, your, your full bounty is at the disposal of the Lord Jesus, whatever that bounty may be.
any that's it absolutely it's not mine praise the lord hallelujah amen anyone else something to add or question to ask amen ah. <laughs> That's all right. It's happened to me before. <laughs> Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we want to thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, we pray that you take the things we've spoken about, and Lord, we've really just skimmed the top of it. But Lord, we want to each and every one of us a definite revelation and understanding of what it means to give. And Father, we do pray and trust that as the Lord Jesus um, is our example, the one who gave all for those who didn't even deserve it, Father, may we follow that example and be willing to give all, whether or not we believe that the receiver of that bounty is worthy or not. Father, I just commit each and every one to you. And we pray that you keep us until we're able to meet again, whether it be in this hall or in the sky. We just pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much.